President Clinton, Ambassadors, UCD colleagues and friends, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this very special occasion. To say that Ireland owes a debt of gratitude to President Bill Clinton would be a supreme understatement. When many political leaders would have taken the, the safer option, President Clinton uh, used, uh, deployed his, his prodigious political acumen, uh, courage, personality, patience and vision to the Northern Ireland pre peace process and played a pivotal role in the resolution of a conflict that had plagued this island for decades. Only moments ago, President Clinton officially opened the Clinton Institute for American Studies at UCD, uh, established with funding from the Irish government to honor his contribution to the peace process. It's my pleasure to open this session by awarding President Clinton the UCD Ulysses Medal. This is the highest award that the university can make. It draws inspiration from our, perhaps UCD's most famous graduate, James Joyce, and was first awarded as part of our Sesame Centennial celebrations in 2004. President Clinton, your ongoing commitment and contribution to peace and prosperity on this island, and indeed to the elimination of poverty and disease throughout the world makes you a more than worthy recipient uh, of this award. And it's my great pleasure now to award President Bill Clinton the UCD Ulysses Medal. Students, distinguished guests, good afternoon and thank you all for your patience. I'm Liam Kennedy, Director of the Clinton Institute for American Studies here at UCD. Now, before I introduce President Clinton, I do have a couple of points on procedure. Firstly, to let you know that President Clinton will address us for approximately 25 minutes and that I will then present him with a number of questions. I'm very pleased to note these questions have been scripted by the students of the Institute. And secondly, on the President's departure, we invite you all to remain with us and join the reception that will be hosted by the Institute and its board. That will take place in the landing here in the auditorium, just beyond these doors. It's tempting to say that President Bill Clinton needs no further introduction, certainly not in this country, where he will always be welcomed and revered as one of the great architects of the peace process in Northern Ireland thereby helping to bring to an end a period of violent turmoil that entrenched the divisions in that society and rippled across this island. Yet we welcome the opportunity to introduce the President on this occasion of his visit to University College Dublin, not only as an architect of our shared island history, but as a friend who has continued to build relationships with us and who is a visionary agent of our shared global futures. The conflict in, Long in Northern Ireland long appeared intractable, both to those of us living in that society and to observers from elsewhere. As is now well known, President Clinton took risks to help build a framework for peace that changed mindsets and convinced us that a different future was possible. From the outset, he understood that peace is a process, that it must be something more than the absence of violence, and so he has continued to support the important work being done to consolidate peace as a foundation for the renewal of society that has to be defined by new opportunities for investment, for jobs, and for political participation. This commitment to renewal in Northern Ireland is also a commitment to the future prosperity of this island, and we recognize the continuing importance of the peace process for every dimension of Irish life, including our economy. This key pillar of Irish life has survived the turmoil of the last few years, not unscathed, but it has survived. The stability of this island is underwritten by the continuing success of the Good Friday Agreement and that stability endures today. Over time, we have come to see that President Clinton's commitment to the peace process and to Ireland is of a peace with his abiding belief that global interdependence and mutuality are the bases for understanding and addressing the most pressing challenges of our time. 
This has been a driving belief in his humanitarian and philanthropic work, which has directly addressed major global challenges such as hunger and food security, HIV, AIDS, energy control. It's a vision that's now very dynamically represented by the work of the Clinton Foundation and of the Clinton Global Initiative, which address global problems through collaborations among businesses, governments, nonprofits, private citizens. It is this sort of vision and activity that is needed to create the foundations for long-term, sustainable development. The aims and values of the Clinton Foundation in developing President Clinton's vision are aligned with the best efforts of Irish men and women today, working in diverse sectors of our society and actively engaged with global challenges to promote development, to fight famine and achieve food security, to bring resolutions to conflicts, and to act as advocates for millions who suffer the effects of poverty, disease, and conflict worldwide. This alignment is very close and tangible in certain instances. In Haiti, for example, where Irish NGOs and others have worked closely with the Clinton Foundation, and in Africa, where Irish Aid and the Clinton Foundation have partnered to establish an HIV AIDS initiative to address the gap in HIV treatment services in several countries. In these and many other ways, the people of Ireland continue to value the work of President Clinton and to work in partnership with him in facing up to global as well as national challenges. In this spirit of partnership, we welcome President Clinton today as a friend whose vision of global initiatives has raised all our horizons. A few months ago, in support of an Irish diaspora gathering in New York, President Clinton remarked, I quote, the Irish have to stay in the future business. Mr. President, we aim to. And we appreciate the concern as well as the support that you lend in exhorting us to look forward. Our key investors in the future business are, of course, our young people, and universities take on a special responsibility in nurturing that investment. We are proud to play our part in that at UCD and at the Clinton Institute for American Studies. When this address was first discussed, we were informed that President Clinton expressed strong interest in addressing our student body. And I'm pleased to inform the President that we've brought together almost all the students who have studied at the Clinton Institute. These students represent our future. They will help keep us in the future business. Right now, Mr. President, they're looking forward to your address. Please welcome President Bill Clinton. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Professor Kennedy, thank you for the introduction and for the work you do here at the Institute. Dr. Brady, thank you for welcoming me to the university and for the Ulysses Award. I couldn't help thinking that had I had at an early stage in my life James Joyce's literary talent, I might have gone into a different line of work. I thank the students for being here, and I intentionally am going to speak without notes today to try to set up the questions that will follow. I have wanted to come here as long as you've been studying here, and my trips to Ireland are always too few and always dictated by a work schedule I have which perversely brought me here on repeated occasions in the last decade when none of you were here. <laughs> so this is a very happy day for me. I was profoundly grateful when the then Taoiseach Bertie Hearn announced 10 years ago that this institute was going to be established in my name and I was grateful all over again when I walked into your building built in 18-1 where the classes are held and I saw this auditorium. Uh, I still can't get used to anything with my name on it. it. It was partly the culture in which I was raised which makes such things seem pretentious and partly because I've always thought that any building with a name on it must be named for a dead person. <laughs> and as nearly as I can tell, I'm still around. Now, having said that, I'd like to begin with the focus of the 
studies of the Institute and move to the world at large. I spent an enormous amount of time today trying to explain to people not what position they should hold on a particular issue, but how I think they should look at the world in which we live. For all of you who are students here, for all younger people, this is especially important. Because if you pick up any day's newspapers, if you look at any edition of the evening news on television, it often seems like the political equivalent of chaos theory in physics. You may remember a lot of the things that are happening, but it's not always immediately apparent what the connection between them is and how it affects your life and what you're supposed to do to have a better future. So let me begin with the quintessential American commitment. In the Declaration of Independence, the founders of the United States pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor to form a more perfect union. They were speaking in the 18th century using language that meant something very specific then. They were the children of the Enlightenment. They still believed that the rule of reason was better than the impulses of passion. And what they meant when they committed to form a more perfect union was that, hey, we're not perfect. We don't have perfect knowledge. We don't have perfect characters. We don't have perfect ability. So we'll never have a perfect country but we can always be more perfect. What it really meant is we pledge ourselves to a country that will always stay in the future business, that will always try to be better and better and better according to our idea of a perfect union, which meant specifically that they would always struggle to deepen the meaning of freedom and expand its reach, to widen the circle of opportunity and to strengthen the bonds of our common humanity. In the 21st century, that's not a bad prescription for what the world should be trying to do. This is the most interdependent age in human history. But interdependence can be good or bad or both. Most cases in the modern world, it's both. All interdependence means is that divorce is not an option. I mean, the two communities in Northern Ireland were perpetually interdependent long before the peace agreement was made. It was just a negative interdependence. There was economic inequality, inequality of educational opportunities, rampant hostility and prejudice, and no small amount of violence. Then they made a peace. They decided that what they, they had more at stake in working together than being divided. But they were not more interdependent after the peace was made, after Stormont was stood up again, after the police and justice powers were devolved, than they were before. They simply shifted from negative to positive interdependence. All the important political decisions you will make in your lives as Irish voters, as citizens of Europe, as citizens of the world, will be against an emerging backdrop of the positive and negative forces of interdependence. And in some form or fashion, at least for the next 20 or 30 years, for the foreseeable future. The mission of humanity on planet Earth is to build the positive and reduce the negative forces of interdependence. 